Thanks for joining me for this episode. I'm glad you're here. I want to talk about what I consider to be a bizarre church shooting, church stabbing, uh, a, a basically a church incident. And I'm not sure that I know what the pieces are, but uh, I know that the police don't have a clear picture of it from everything that I'm hearing and reading. So let's uh, get right into talking about the facts. Cleveland, Ohio, a church, 11.52 a.m., police receive a shot spotter alert of four rounds that are shot. So if you're not familiar with the shot spotter, it's some pretty cool technology that cities with that want to make the investment have uh, high crime, lots of violence. They can put these up around town and the shot spotters sense gunfire. It's technology that senses a gunfire and then also tri triangulates and narrows down within a small area of where those shots are coming from. So police can get to responding. So uh, they received the shot spotter alert of four shots in the area of East 131 and Cronell Avenue in uh, Cleveland. Uh, they roll to the area when they arrive in the area. There's nobody flagging them down. They're checking the area. I'm, I'm imagining they're running a two or three, four block area and nobody's flagging them down. Nobody's running around, nothing going on. Uh, about a minute later, they get a 911 call of a gunshot victim at the church that we're talking about. The police arrive to the church and find a gunshot victim that's actually down the street, just a little bit. A witness points out the gunshot victim to them. So uh, what basically their perspective, these are the things that they're writing about and talking to the press about. And I hope you'll stick with me because I do have a couple of things I want to say. This is bizarre. But I do have a couple of lessons we can learn from this. And, and that's really my goal is that we're all learning from this bizarre story. Now, the police perspective continues. They find a gunshot victim that has uh, three gunshot wounds. And the victim tells them that he does attend this church regularly. And uh, today, some guy got mad at him because he was in his seat. So he apparently comes in, sits down in somebody else's seat, and the guy gets mad at him. The victim says, so the gunshot victim says, the man tried to force him out of the seat, then shot him. Now, I do want to say that people were saying this gunshot victim was intoxicated. So some of the things that he's reporting here, you know, I don't quite understand it, but it's the same thing going on with the other witnesses in this. It's, it's bizarre. Gunshot victim eventually admits to also stabbing a member, member of the church to protect himself. That doesn't say the guy that was pushing him around and, and shot him. He doesn't say he stabbed him. In fact, it sounds like those are two different people. The police could not find a stabbing victim. They couldn't find the shooter and they couldn't find a stabbing victim. The thought was, hey, he went to the hospital. In fact, I think that's what some of the witnesses maybe eventually said, but the police could not find him. So, uh, uh, continuing their interviews, their police perspective, about a half hour after they're on scene, there's another situation that comes forward, and uh, it's an usher from the church who comes forward and tells the police he was actually physically assaulted by the gunshot victim. So he actually assaulted him. According to police, they tried to question 30 to 40 people at the church who were basically refusing information or not being cooperative with him. They didn't want to talk to him, which is, I guess, there must be some tension in that community between the people and law enforcement. I, I don't know what the good explanation could be for that. The police do find three shell casings in the back parking lot of the church. Now, the shot spotter said there was four shots. They find three shell casings. And uh, your subject, your victim is shot three times. Now there's uh, the down on the right, lower right there, you'll see pictures of the church. This is uh, off to the side out front. I'm not sure which because there's a couple of doors from what I can see on Google. And now here's an interview the pastor's doing, and I'm going to reference it, but I don't have permission to show you the interview, to do the video and the audio. Here's a picture, though, to give you an idea of the pews in the back of the church. This is where the pastors, I'm going to quote him a couple of things, but this happened in that pew there on the left side of that picture is where this stuff apparently uh, started in the church. Now, the witness statements, the usher says the gunshot victim came 
into the church intoxicated and sat between two girls in a pew, and apparently the back pew. The usher asked the gunshot victim to move to a different seat, which he did, and during the move, sat on the usher's hat, which I'm, I'm starting to speculate here now. And the two ushers then, so that usher got another usher, and uh, the two ushers started escorting who becomes the eventual gunshot victim out the back door. And the gunshot victim punches one of the ushers. And now remember, he reported that to police. So now basically, as we're tracking this, we have an assault victim, we have a stabbing victim, and we have a gunshot victim. And so, and I'm not sure what else was going on that initially started getting the ushers after him, if there was some kind of harassment going on with the girls or what the deal was, but the gunshot victim said he, somebody got after him. Was that the usher because of where he was sitting? Uh, and he said it was in his seat. Uh, just in, very interesting stuff here. You know, so the two ush ushers get him out of the church. Now, some side notes here that I just want to mention. One pastor told police that the camera system at the church did not work. Of course, they're looking to see if they can identify suspects and victims and, and get some evidence of this mess that's going on. Because don't forget, nobody will talk to them. It sounds like you've got an usher and maybe, an, maybe the gunshot victim are talking to the police, maybe one other person. The other, now, the one pastor tells the police that the camera system at the church doesn't work. Plain and simple, doesn't work. And then the other pastors, in fact, I, I think that I was under the impression from the news information that there was three other pastors that told the police that the cameras did work. So they went and checked them out and found out the backdoor camera, which was the important one because they sent this, the, the ushers tossed this guy out the back door. So uh, they couldn't get it to work. It was offline, not working. So now, here's another one of my points that I'm going to be making here. So I'm hoping you're sticking with me here. During the interview, during the pastor does a news interview that you can look up, and he says, and it's basically kind of a mess, nothing against him. I respect what he's gone through. It's a stress. He's trying to protect his congregation. He's trying to protect his church. But it doesn't come across real well as he's doing the interview. First, he says he, no one saw what happened in the church, but heard shots. So he's trying to say that information as he's given the news person the interview, uh, the tour, kind of in explaining things to him. And then he says, we know the guy's name that got shot, but we had some guests here and something happened in the back, some kind of dialogue. And he alerted the pastor. He says he alerted security. And they got him out. So that kind of doesn't make sense with what was going, what we're being told by ushers and stuff happen. Our congregation, according to the pastor, he said, our congregation had nothing to do with this. It was gun violence that came to us. And so, you know, I see a lot, of, really in this whole thing, I see a lot of defensiveness. I see a lot of lack of cooperation, it sounds like, to trying to get this situation resolved. There doesn't seem to be many boundaries because we're not willing to tell the police who was who or help them find who was who kind of thing, other than this one gunshot victim who needed medical attention. And so uh, it doesn't seem like, and, and I think boundaries, we haven't talked about boundaries in a while, but boundaries are important. When you have situations going on, it's like we need to draw a line and say, you guys can't come in here anymore, or you can't come in here until you deal with this issue or whatever it is that we're going to process or uh, press charges, those kind of things. So I am, uh, you know, a little concerned about that. And I'm always suggesting that if we have someone that interrupts our services, somebody that comes in intoxicated, like in this situation, causes issues, and these other people, I don't, we don't even know who these other people are. Police don't know. And so, you know, but we need to draw boundaries and say, we want to tell these people they're trespassing or we want to prosecute them and we don't want to have these issues. That's, that's the only way you're going to keep this kind of what the pastor calls gun violence 
uh, from coming back is if you're prosecuting people and, and cooperating with law enforcement, those kind of things, in my opinion, this is all about my opinion here uh, from the facts. So uh, then what we see is uh, the lessons that I see. First of all, the boundary stuff, we got to deal with that. I think we've got to prosecute people and you guys can let me know down below in the comments section if you're uh, watching this on YouTube. But we need we also need a relationship with law enforcement. We need to be cooperative with them. If we have issues with law enforcement, we need to go to them and try to work that out. And, and I can say, you know, in some communities, that may be tough to do with law enforcement. It may be a challenge. As a former law enforcement officer, I know that. Sometimes that happens. But we need to do our best to have a great re relationship with local law enforcement. That's long-term, having meetings with them, supporting them where we can. And also, short-term, when something happens at our church, we should be cooperative with them. We should be telling them what we know, explaining things to them, and not trying to not get involved. And, and again, I'm not there, and somebody can tell me if they know if they're from that area, but this could be predominant gang violence, and people are afraid of that. I understand that, but we need to try to do our best to be cooperative and 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 draw our boundaries, those kind of things. And I also want to say, and I'm saying this in support and in love of this pastor, uh, for for concern for him is, I do think that we need to consider having a spokesperson who's trained and ready to talk on behalf of the church if something major happens. And I don't believe it should be the lead pastor. I think it should be maybe your security team leader. Somebody get some training on dealing with the media, dealing with the press, and being a not at the top person that's in charge of the liability of the church and all of that kind of stuff. It's more concerned about that. Somebody that can talk to the media, explain things, and that gets a little bit of training in this area so that we can handle these things without making it worse. Uh, by the things that we say, because we're not sure of what to say. So that's my thoughts. A bizarre incident. I appreciate you sticking with me. And hey, I want to encourage you. We've got all kinds of training, all kinds of resources for you down in the comments section here on YouTube. Go take a look at that. Uh, and also take a look at this video because it's the next one that I would recommend to you and YouTube recommends for you to take a look at.